Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Lots of traffic out there, and today, though, we have wonderful young lady, Stacy Sutton, Dr. Stacy Sutton, and next week, uh, at least September the 28th, uh, she will be in Baltimore to have a panel discussion on the role of cooperatives in reshaping communities. Good morning, Dr. Sutton. Good morning. How are you? I am rushed. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Lots and lots of traffic this morning, but I'm glad to be here, glad you're on. Thank you so much. You're with the Department of Urban Planning and Policy at the College of Urban Planning and Policy Affairs at the University of Illinois in Chicago. That's a mouthful. It is a mouthful. It is a mouthful, but well worth it. (laughs) Okay. How did you get into this line of work? What were the choices you made? Yeah, I made a set of choices um, in terms of Well, my choices were motivated by an interest in community economic development. And I grew up in in, uh, New York, uh, in Brooklyn, and then New Rochelle, but always connected to Brooklyn. And I was fascinated by what was happening in terms of urban decline, urban revitalization in in different neighborhoods and how it looked different across the city. So I thought one way to go about um, kind of addressing and creating more equitable development in our communities was to learn about business development. How do, how do we start viable businesses that can serve the needs of residents? And so I did an MBA and worked in corporate for a while. I thought that would be useful in terms of learning some of the analytical skills, but that really wasn't helping me address the stuff on the ground that I wanted to do. Um, I was you know, solving problems of large corporations, and that wasn't what may have. Dr. Sen, I'm sorry, but can you tell me, do you have a moment when you, this thing piqued your curiosity? You're walking around Brooklyn on the subway. What said, you know, there's a decline going on here. What piqued your curiosity? Were you 12, 15 years old? What what sort of got that for you? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know if it was one thing. It was, you know, the way that New York is structured is you, you know, you take up the subway and you move through the city and through neighborhoods pretty regularly. And so moving from or kind of traveling across Brooklyn um, or from Brooklyn to Manhattan, from Bedford-Stuyvesant to Upper West Side, or even from Bedford-Stuyvesant to Harlem and stopping in between there, you see a great disparity, right? So I, I, don't, I can't point to one moment, but it was part of my lived experience in terms of seeing the differences across the neighborhood. I have it that I was 12. We were going to the basketball court. It was on the north side of town. No, somebody said, why don't they make a basketball court here? And mm. I wondered, who's they? Mm. And why don't we do it? And mm-hmm. that yeah. was, and I was 12-ish when that thought crossed my mind and got me into, and I ended up with an MBA also, of trying to figure out, you know, how do you, how do you get things to change? How do you get things yeah. to happen? Yeah, so I, I can't say at the specific moment, but I knew that it was something that people, that we had to do in our community. And... As I was saying, the MBA was perhaps it, it, it provided a lot of skills, but it wasn't the right path to, mm-hmm. to doing it. And so I started to learn about policy and realizing how important policy is. And then a mentor said, "You should really think about urban planning." I didn't know anything about urban planning, and really directed me to PhD program in urban planning and policy. So that's kind of how I started thinking about it. And I knew that I would enter with a specialization in economic development and you know, urban revitalization. And so that took you to your doctorate in urban planning. Yes. And so I did my PhD in urban planning at Rutgers in New Brunswick. And then from there, I was teaching. I um, did a lot of consulting, working with community groups, and started my first academic 
academic job at Columbia University in New York in their urban planning program. And then more recently, I started at UIC University, Illinois, Chicago, in the, we call it CUPA, in the College of Urban Planning and Public Affairs. And that's where I am. Okay. Wonderful. I usually ask this question at the end, but I'm going to ask you now. Do you like what you do? Yes. Why? Well, do I like what I do? I do. (laughs) I like the possibilities it creates, right? I like what I do in terms of the autonomy. There's a lot of autonomy and flexibility in academia, but there are a lot of pressures that, that, um, that I perhaps don't like. But I like the idea that we can think about problems and try to do some of the research, you know, fundamentally I'm a researcher, right? So you think of professors as teachers, but most of us are primarily researchers. And we can do some of the background work that really helps, kind of fuels some of the work on the ground, right? Some folks, you know, we're trained to do, to gather that information and to put it together in a coherent narrative so that people can use that either to make policy or to make a set of decisions. And I really like that idea. I kind of like working in the background. Okay. Okay. Working in the background, getting things done. Getting things done that have purpose, right, that have meaning for communities, for the communities I care about, for marginalized communities, for black and brown communities. And if we can use some of the tools that are being used sometimes against the communities in terms of policy decisions, if you're not in those debates, your communities are, you know, often disadvantaged by the outcome. So you need the evidence, you need the research, you need somebody at the table or, or, you know, conveying the information so that you can be at the table and engage in those debates. And so when I say in the background, it's like creating those materials that can make a compelling argument. Okay, so what is some of the research that you've done? Uh, Yeah, I do a lot of things. So uh, most recently I published an article on gentrification and racial transition. And it was looking, um, I looked at New York over 50 years. And in doing that, I think we know through our lived experience that a lot of neighborhoods are changing, the socioeconomic and demographic composition of neighborhoods change. But I think the degree to which you can start to quantify some of that um, and, and align that with the narratives and the journalistic pieces, you start to make a compelling argument. So that piece really focuses on using census data to show that not only are neighborhoods changing, it's not just the poor people that are leaving or being displaced, but there are kind of a lot of middle-income people that are living in market-rate housing, right, that don't have the protections of affordable housing that are forced to leave neighborhoods, and that contributes to the racial transition and movement from majority black neighborhoods to becoming um, increasingly white neighborhoods, and I so, saw that. So uh, what, is, what, is gen- what is gentrification? So (laughs) gentrification is a process. It's both a social and economic process whereby um, neighborhoods that were historically disinvested by private sector, public sector, and and so forth um, become attractive to capital. And when I say capital, I mean both individuals as well as developers, um, you know, city policies that allow, that incentivize development. And in doing that, um, these neighborhoods are attractive because because the land values are so low and they had been low for a long time. So that reinvestment, and usually a lar- large scale reinvestments, inflate land values, but they also it d- displace the residents that were there because they could no longer afford to stay there. Now that the land values, the, the rents have increased. So um, gentrification is that process by which that happens. So I've always thought of it as. Black and brown people have been pushed out and white people coming in. I mean, I'm yeah, well, that's, that's how it looks, right? <laughs> that's, that's often how it looks. It's not the only way it looks, but that is the outcome um, that we're seeing more and more. And we, but there are a set of reasons and set of things that happened before that. So D.C., Chocolate City is no yes. longer as chocolate as it used to be. Absolutely. Um, that's a huge, a huge thing in the news, and people are writing about that and talking about that and you know, the first time in half a century that the city is no longer majority black. And I I do property management as my full-time job. This program and co-ops is what I love to talk about. But just watching rents that was $500 in 94 when I started, it's now twelve to $1,500. Mm-hmm. And the building yeah. hasn't changed that much. Right. 
Right. right. So then the question is, well, who who can afford that? Mm-hmm. And who, who who are you targeting to live there? Rents are going up much faster than income, right? So cost of living adjustments don't really – won't get you from 500 to – To 15. We've got to take our first break. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> we have so much engrossed in this conversation. We'll be right back, everybody. Please don't touch that down. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM, W-O-L, 95.9 FM. Information is power. Well, not quite. Information has the access to power. You have to get the information and then put some action to it, and that's where you get the power. And the National Cooperative Bank is sponsoring this program so that you can get information about cooperatives and different ways of shaping your community, of solving community problems. And by the way, we're having a panel discussion of role cooperatives can play in reshaping disinvested communities. Uh, happens with gentrification or what happens with these communities before gentrification. And that's going to be on Saturday, September 28th from 10 to 1 at the Living Well in Baltimore. The Living Well is at 235 Holiday Street. It's going to be on the second floor, September 28th. And Dr. Stacy Sutton is one of the four panelists. And she's on today and talking about her research on first we talked about a little bit about gentrification. So Dr. Sutton, growing up in Brooklyn and getting this some question and query about uh, how can we help ourselves, what did you find out with your research on gentrification? Well, I mean, I think they're separate. So the gentrification is, um, I think one thing I learned is that we didn't collectively own things, right? So a large study that I did looked at black-owned businesses that had been in the neighborhood for, you know, for over 50 years, and they were closing. They were closing. I mean, businesses closed, but I looked at businesses that had been there for a long time and businesses that had emerged more recently, but um, it was understood as... uh, Concentration of black-owned businesses that were that that had changed by 2008, 10, 12, and so uh, one of the things I realized is like, well, one, we don't own the properties there, so you can easily you you can't re- renew your lease and you have to find another location. But collectively, there were a number of efforts that these merchants, the merchant associations, came together and tried to do things collectively. But it was perhaps a little late. But if we really thought about that early, if we thought about collective ownership as a as a viable and 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 uh, sustainable alternative to just individual kind of accumulation, uh, we could do better for ourselves and for a community overall. So from that study, I started to focus more systematically on cooperative, particularly worker-owned cooperative, and what they do in terms of anchoring local the local economies of communities. So I have a definition of worker-owned cooperatives. It could be any business you can think of if the employees own and control the business. Correct. If they own and control the business employees, then that's a worker-owned cooperative. Yes. And so they all – so all of the workers are the owners, and they they also have full – when you say control in terms of, uh, you know, decision-making. Each Mm -hmm. member has one vote. It's not – but you don't have more power if you – put more into the business, it's it's really important that they're democratic and equitable so that every one person has one vote. And I really like that one member, one vote, because it means that the, the, the capitalistic model, which I don't know about your MBA, but when I got mine, the decisions was, were made mainly on what's the greatest return to the investor, to the stock owner. Correct. And uh, what's the ROI, yep. return on investment? And not what's best for the employees or what's best for the environment or what's best for just what's best for the shareholders. So the more money one had, the more voting they had and for the board of directors or whatever, and the bigger return they got. Yes. Okay. That so is that's, the conventional that's the, capitalist model. Yes. That's the main model. So that's why I've fallen in love with the cooperative model for the things that you're talking about. One member, one vote. So if there's a profit, they decide how their profit split up. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. And not all cooperatives are worker-owned, but that's I focus on the worker-owned cooperative. There are other types.
financial cooperatives, as you know, you know, uh, mm -hmm. the retail or consumer cooperatives and producer cooperatives, uh, purchasing cooperatives. But the worker and the, the reason that's so important for communities is because as a worker, you're also the owner and making those decisions in terms of every decision. You're learning about the business as you're participating in the business, and you have a, and you have equal say in how that business operates and, and how it reinvests both in the enterprise and in community. Real quickly, the other types are the three that you mentioned. One, the consumer is if the consumer, the person that buys the products or services, owns the business, owns and controls so the business. Member, yes, so the member owner. So if you think of like a food cooperative or some other retail, large retail Food, housing, credit union are the main yes. three I think about. Yeah, those are the primary. And the other one I mentioned is more producer, like agriculture, large agriculture entities, uh, everything from Land of Lakes to Ocean Spray, you know, these large companies that are cooperatives, but there's always that question of, well, the farmers are working, the, the owners of the farms are working cooperatively, but how are the, the workers on the farms treated and what's the pay and so forth? They don't have say in day-to-day in -day operations per se. When the uh, artists it, are beginning to use this model, I call it a marketing cooperative, producer cooperative equally. Um, yep. But artists are beginning. I, I've interviewed a couple, Ujama in Pittsburgh and one up in, in um, Ithaca, New York, where they'll come together and buy a, either warehouse space or storefronted, and they're all producing, put their goods in there and sell it, and they, they work in that cooperative to sell their mm -hmm. goods. Yep, that's another model, absolutely. And then there's the purchasing cooperative. The purchasing, yep. And so that, I mean, that has a long history especially in black communities, of like buying clubs where just because of economies of scale, you can buy products, a large amount of product, and it's cheaper by buying it in bulk. So you come together, either as individuals, it used to be as individuals, but it could be small businesses, come together as a buying, purchasing club and work collectively that way. Yeah, we have it at, had it at our church. At least I was very much involved in raising my children is that we bought buck. Uh, vegetables and and fruit, and then distributed. And what was interesting was I got I got so much for the amount of money that I could not. I ended up giving it to my sisters and their families because yeah. it was so <laughs> much food, yes, and good right. food. Right. Yeah. So that was the buying club is working together to buy to put your money together to get more product and a better quality normally. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. So those are the four main types. And it's beginning that some like food co-ops are getting their hybrids where they're both consumer-owned and employee-owned. And that would be interesting yeah. if the farmers would ever do something like that. that would yeah, I'm hoping. I mean, we can only ho hope and push and encourage. And that's the beauty of a worker cooperative. Any other form of cooperative could also be a worker cooperative. And worker cooperatives are the most expansive in terms of they can operate in any industry. So it's only logical that the workers at a food cooperative would be the owners as well, but so can the members be owners, meaning so it's just an, it's a legal structure they have to work out, but it's absolutely feasible. I got in this, in this property management that I do, in this gentrification, land values go up and therefore property taxes go up, mm -hmm. insurance goes up. I even find that maintenance people will raise their their price there per hour so that maintenance goes up, property taxes go up, insurance go up, and people can't afford to, I mean, if you've got somebody that's retired and they maybe have lived there for 30, 40, 50 years in a brownstone in Brooklyn or D.C., they can't afford that anymore, and they have to move or they're going to lose it. And some people have lost it mm -hmm. uh, through auctions, tax auctions or whatever. So what are some of the other problems with gentrification? I mean, so yes, it's the issue of people losing their property, but it's also the change in the character of the neighborhood, right? So those with higher status, you know, higher income people uh, come into the neighborhood and, you know, uh, they want ch change certain types of changes and they're not doing it in any kind of participatory way. That includes residents that have been there, the longstanding residents. And so there's often a kind of a cultural tension. Um, yes. Uh, within the neighborhoods, and it then uh, it plays on businesses in terms of what kinds of businesses come and who those businesses cater to, not catering to longstanding residents only. Cater. It plays out in terms of policing and surveillance, how the neighborhoods are changed because of, you know, it might be hyper-policing. 
and to, to, to protect the newcomers. I mean, there's a there's an array of possibilities that we see that, that happen in gentrifying neighborhoods that people no longer feel, people that have been there a long time and really brave those lean years, the years that the neighborhood was disparaged and uh, others didn't want to live there. Mm-hmm. Um, once it starts to kind of become attractive to kind of the middle class and upper middle class residents, the the whole character of that place shifts. Um, and so people leave, they feel socially excluded from their neighborhood. And so even if they can stay, they often don't want to stay. Yes, I've seen it play out and it's, it's tough. We have a, another minute before our second break. And so, okay, that's gentrification. Just could you name off some other research you've done? Uh, so I do uh, stuff on uh, that's connected. I mean, stuff on commercial revitalization, how um, the role of small business owners in, in revitalizing neighborhoods. I do work on um, what a project I have now is called the Punitive City. It looks at policies and the disparate impact of different types of policies, uh, particularly kind of the the racial disparities in policies, place-based policies, like tickets, the camera tickets, um, the speeding and, and red light tickets, and, and how they affect Doc- communities. Dr. Seddon, we'll be right back. I love this conversation. Thank you so very much. We'll be right back. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM, WO at 95.9 FM. Welcome back, everybody. This is Bernard Oaks. The program is brought to you by the National Cooperative Bank. And Dr. Sutton, you talked about punitive cities, and somewhere I heard you'd, you'd done some research on cooperative cities. Yes. So I was hoping we'd get there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so that is the other side. So one side looks at the punitive policies of cities, and the other looks at uh, you know, ways in which cities can enable greater possibilities and economic opportunities for residents. And that is a paper and, and a, l- a larger body of work that look called Cooperative Cities, whereby I look at cities that have created policies for um, or an environment for worker-owned own cooperatives to thrive. So... What are some of those? I know D.C. was not in one of those cities. Yeah, so that's the thing. So a lot of people wonder, why isn't my city there? Why isn't my city? So the methodology I used was, so it's not that these cities, some cities of many cities have worker-owned cooperatives operating. I was particularly interested in the way in which the city kind of actively supports that, right? Not just it, it just happens, but the city is doing something. So did they pass the resolution? Did they implement some kind of worker-owned kind of policy? Did they put money into the budget for it? That would signal that, okay, the city is behind this. And the first time that we really start, started to see that happen was after 2009. So this it, cities, the so worker cooperatives, as we know, have been around since the you know, 19th century. But the cities and um, municipalities haven't been actively involved in supporting their development and sustainability. So we started to see that change in 2009. So we start, it started with like Cleveland, Richmond, Virginia, and Rochester, kind of cities where the municipality invested, along with philanthropy and others, in starting worker-owned cooperatives, right? They were very active in starting. Then there's another so this is after the Great Recession of 2007, 2008. Recession, yes. So there is that sense that, okay, people are not gainfully employed, the labor market is not uh, Cap- absorbing. Capitalism is not working. Okay. If capitalism is not working. <laughs> that's essentially what it comes down to, right? Okay. It just it isn't working and it hasn't worked. That's the thing. I don't think city managers aren't articulating it that way, but nevertheless, okay. that's what you know what's going down, right? That's what it is. And so then there's another bunch of cities where there are a lot of worker cooperatives. And the city said, okay, I'm going to put a million and a half dollars per year over X number of years. Or so in New York, it was a 1.3 in the beginning, and then it was 2 point something, and now it's up to 3 point something million dollars each year to support not just the individual enterprises, worker-owned enterprises, but the whole support system, the technical assistance providers, those who, you know, uh, do what they call cooperative developers or cooperative incubators, uh, those who provide legal support, all those things. Um, It's not just supporting the business, but you need to support the supports. So New York, Madison, Wisconsin, Minneapolis, they're really cultivating 
uh, worker-owned cooperatives. And then the other cities before, that I, Before you pass on, yep. though, I want to go back to New York again, because in our panel on the September 28th, uh, Helen Rosenthal will yes. be on the panel. She and she's on the city council from New York who helped bring about getting that money allocated in the city's budget. So she will be on the, on, on the panel also. Yes, she will. And she was instrumental, right? So we need more Helen Rosenthal in all of our cities. And one thing I noticed is you need to have a champion. You need someone that says, okay, let's try this, because it's not the norm in many cities. But cities put money into all sorts of things, and the degree to which you're willing to take that risk, and you'll learn quickly that it wasn't really a risky venture at all, but rather a logical, very rational, reasonable way to support small business development. We put money into small businesses and entrepreneurship, but by supporting worker and cooperatives, what you're doing is supporting business ownership that has more possibility for survival because people are working together. It creates better working environments. They're less discriminatory in terms of who's included. They're anchored in communities, right? So these mm -hmm. are typically enterprises that are anchored in communities. The worker owners are often from those communities, and so they're supporting local economies. The principles of worker of, of cooperatives uh, means that they're doing business with other cooperatives, so you're supporting this broader ecosystem. I mean, there's so many benefits of doing that rather than just supporting an individual entrepreneur with a good idea. These are also entrepreneurs with good ideas, but they're coming together to make this work and to, to support communities. So I want to give so, a shout-out to Dr. Jessica gordon Nimhard, who yes. wrote the book Collective Courage. She's been on the show a two or three times now. I'd like to get her on for Black History Month. thank you for doing that. She is one of my kind of motivating and inspirational kind of both scholars and activists doing this work. It's her work that motivated my thinking, a paper she wrote in 1999. So if you ask when did I start thinking about this more systematically, more clearly, she, a paper she wrote in 1999 helped me kind of bring community, econ community economic to get, uh, development together with cooperatives as a possibility. So she, in her book, said, or at least a paper of her book, I read that 90% of uh, worker cooperatives are still in existence after five years. But yeah. in the capitalistic model, only 10 or 15% are still in existence after five years. After five years, absolutely. So I, can't, I don't know. I mean, I would trust if she said that, I, the numbers. Uh, but we know for sure the numbers are hugely d d different in terms of the survival rate. After five years, so the first five years for any enterprise is difficult, right? Mm -hmm. But once you survive those first five years, worker-owned cooperatives sustain longer and, you know, they're able to sustain longer, partly because you realize, okay, look, we've made this commitment and we're in it together and you will make certain sacrifices during the hard times. But those sacrifices aren't like firing people. You don't have to do that because you all own this business so you wouldn't be downsized, but rather you might have to just, just kind of think about the business differently, make some different other decisions until you can regroup. So that's a very different model than a capitalist model where they either close uh, or downsize. The other one in the book, Communities Building Wealth, they gave a, a snapshot of Christina in New York, who was a maid who was making seven bucks an hour. And after she, I can't read, I don't remember if she joined a co-op or helped create a co-op, she was up to 20 bucks an hour, particularly with the patronage fund. And that's yeah. whatever is yeah. made, a certain portion of that can go to the workers based on what the workers collectively decide to do. Absolutely. I mean, imagine that. You get to decide how the dividends are reallocated. And some people say, oh, well, people will always just take all the money back. No, why would you? Most of the time, those patronage dividends are divided. Part of it is divided amongst all the worker owners. The other part is reinvested in the business so it can thrive, Right. You're seeing some of the low-end occupations, whether it's home care workers or cleaners in the homes, organize as, as worker-owned cooperatives, and their pay changes dramatically. Their uh, turnover rate declines, right? So some jobs that were the workers used to come, come in and out, right, because you can't really sustain a family that way. On those wages, we're seeing a dramatic change once the, a business is organized as a worker owner. There's more, there's greater wages, more sustainability, more survival for the enterprise, and so forth. So I've heard on this on this show, um, well, there's 
one group, and I can't remember which one. Their, their motto is people first, planet second, and then profits. And they also will take one-third of their profit or surplus, one-third of it to stay in the business for growth, one-third of it for social responsibility, giving back to the community, and one-third of it for the employees. Yeah, that's great. But Beautiful. they decide. <laughs> okay. It could be half and half, or it could be any sort of model, yeah, but the critical piece is the employees decide how that money is split up. And I kind of believe that the employees are really in there who's on the front line. They make better choices, and therefore they get more business, and they perhaps make more profit, and then they have more that they can share. It's it's a win-win-win. Have you found any reasons why this doesn't happen or why it hasn't happened? Because some countries, it's more worker-owned cooperatives than here in the U.S. Yeah, many countries. <laughs> many countries, there are a lot more. I mean, there are a number of reasons why. I think it's unfamiliar, right? Uh, there are more worker-owned cooperatives in different European countries, in Italy, in Spain, in Canada, you know, even there are a lot more in Latin American countries. So then the question is, there are more in African countries as well. And so the question is, well, why not in the U.S.? Why aren't we using this model? And we are, so it's growing. So first we should say it is growing. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a lack of awareness as a model, as a reasonable, logical, viable kind of alternative to capitalism, just people don't aren't familiar with it, that we are not educated to be democratic in schools. When you think about that, we keep talking about democracy, democracy, but we're really not educated to be fully participatory, fully engaged in our kind of economic life from childhood, right? When we go to school, we're trained to be an owner. You want to either be a worker or the owner, or, you know, some kids are just trained to just stand in line and, you know, follow rules. It's like, well, imagine if we've taught our young people to both be entrepreneurial, think of great ideas, but work collectively. Right? We don't really, you know, you told the kid to share something, but not eh, not really, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? especially if you can win. It's all about winning. Well, how about if you can win collectively? And so the, that idea is not ingrained in us. So that's part of it. So then when you get to the workplace, by the time you're an adult, you don't know how to make these decisions. You don't think you know how. But then you learn, oh, you could do this that your voice, your ideas are equally valued. Everyone won't have the same skill, but collectively we will have enough skill, right? Wow. Everyone doesn't have to have the same education. Collectively we will have what we need. I don't need to know how to build the home, you know, and, and do the masonry. I don't need to because somebody else knows how to do that part. And if we can understand that and recognize that, no, nobody, we can trust each other because we all win in this. We all get to see the books. We all learn how the dollars and cents at the bottom line, what that looks like. There's no kind of smoke and mirrors because we can all sit and look at that and learn, even if that's not your forte. You're sitting at the table, and if it doesn't make sense to you, within cooperatives, you're supposed to kind of fully unpack how decisions are made if it's not something you're kind of familiar with. And so it's a slower process, right? It's a slower process in the beginning. We're used to somebody else making all the money and making all the decisions. And they sit in big chairs in comfortable offices, and they take, you know, whatever the responsibility is and when it doesn't go well. But we can do this. We can do this. And, and you can have a thriving enterprise. We're not just talking about small, tiny shops. We're talking about things like the Madrigon, right? It has like 50,000 worker owners. And 130 different enterprises, high-tech enterprises, starting with making refrigerators, you know, engineers coming together and thinking about you know, working as a worker in cooperative, right? And and they also work in finance. They work in you know, – They have their own bank. They have their own oh, their university. Own bank, I mean, right? So it's very yeah. sophisticated. I think right away we go, oh, a little food co-op selling, selling uh, you know, tofu. No, that, that is one option, but that's not the only option, and that is not the only model, right? We're talking about any enterprise that you see, that you engage, that you participate in, any business, it could be a worker-run business. Dr. Sutton, I, I hear your love for this model as yeah, I yeah, have it, right. and I'm laughing over here to food co-op selling tofu, hippies selling <laughs> tofu, but we're taking our last break. <laughs> it goes fast. We're, I'm enjoying it. Thank you so very much. <laughs> we'll be right back.
Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. The program is Everything Cooperative, and we have Dr. Stacy Sutton on the line with us, and there's going to be a panel of experts. She is one of four who uh, will be asked, addressing the role of cooperatives in reshaping communities, which is Friday, September 28th. It's at the Living Well in Baltimore at 235 Holiday Street. It's from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., 10 to 2 and Ron Hans, who's the founder and the board president of Network for Developing Conscious Communities, is putting this on. He's doing great work. That's the Network for Developing Conscious Communities. You can go to his webpage to get more information. That's www.ndccnetwork.org. Ron is doing great work, and yours truly will be moderator of the panel, and I'm looking forward to it. Dr. Stacy Sutton. We got growing up in Brooklyn and getting a Ph.D. and then doing all of this research. She likes to be behind the scenes helping policymakers create laws and policies. So you're talking about the punitive side and then the building side is on the corporate. And it's much bigger than a food co-op selling tofu, hippies selling tofu. And well, yes. I mean, I didn't <laughs> say it exactly that way, but yes. I, I, I'm there, adding to it. I'm adding to it. <laughs> You're going to add to it. Yeah, so this is the enabling side, the side, the things the cities can do to really support this and encourage this through uh, whether it's and, – and, you know, cities can be, advocate, can be advocates, right? They can uh, – city leaders, meaning municipal leaders, they can be champions of different ideas. And the degree to which um, in New York, Helen Rosenthal – um, and the mayor in New York kind of were champions and are champions of this. We've seen, you know, multiple millions of dollars go into this in terms of starting and supporting worker-owned cooperatives since I think it started in 2015. But the same thing in Madison, Wisconsin, a small city, but the mayor allocated five million dollars starting in 2016 to support worker-owned cooperatives. Right? That's one million a year for five uh, years. Yeah, five, one million a year for five years. So that's significant when we're talking about um, a fairly small-sized city, but it's a city that which cooperative is a, a cooperative model, agricultural cooperatives and, um, and other forms of cooperatives are part of the culture uh, and, and retail cult, uh, cooperatives, but they're, they're really spurring worker-owned cooperatives now. And so the degree to which other cities are doing that, they're passing legislation and really making some form of resolution or ordinance that says, okay, these businesses are viable. We should start organizing businesses this way. And we're seeing more and more in Bo- in Boston, in Berkeley, California, Oakland, Philadelphia. And a woman from Philadelphia will also be in the panel on next, I think it's next Friday. So all of these cities are cities that I studied, a total of 12. Um, surprisingly, the city that I live in currently, in Chicago, they weren't on the list. They weren't on the list because they... While a couple of worker-owned properties exist here, the city did not pass a resolution or do anything that really enabled that. And so we're working with some colleagues and some friends and some organizers and cooperative developers, and I are creating this coalition. It's called the Chicagoland Cooperative Ecosystem Coalition. Chicagoland? Yeah, Chicagoland. So Chicago is, you know, the city, but then there's the whole Cook County People call it Chicago land because it's okay. a broader kind of metro area. And we're trying to get both the Cook County commissioners as well as the city council and the mayor's office to pass a resolution supporting worker-owned cooperatives. And then, of course, for a three-year pilot program whereby we're trying to get both philanthropy and the city to invest in supporting the, the broader ecosystem of cooperatives. And it's moving forward. Uh, we're having a big town hall meeting in October to bring people together to really talk about what we need and what we want. And so I think more and more and more cities, it's very similar to what's happening in, in Baltimore and D.C. area. People are realizing that this model can work. We need to educate ourselves and educate our, our neighbors and educate our elected officials. They don't know. They just aren't familiar with it. So the degree to which we can get them in the room so they can see that this this works. This creates economic development. This creates sustainable economic development. It creates equitable economic development. They would be compelled to really support the endeavor because we know from, from history and from research that the economic development models that they've been following create inequality. 
And that is why we have such inequality and that parts of our cities have deep investment and are well-developed and have the best schools, the best services, the best retail. Other parts of our cities you know, haven't had investment, and we don't want the kind of investment that they had historically. Liquor we want stores. community-grounded investment. They have liquor stores and cash. Yeah, right. And when I say that, I don't mean, oh, well, let's bring in outside investment. No, that is that is a model. And some people will say, well, we just want a supermarket. And that's fine. But there are other ways of doing it. I'm working with a community here in Chicago. It's called the Austin Neighborhood. And it's the largest neighborhood in Chicago, 97,000 residents in this one neighborhood, predominantly black. And we're working on a food cooperative. Right? It's considered a food desert. Well, if you need a supermarket, why can't we create it as a food cooperative? It doesn't have to be a health, a healthy food store, right? It can sell healthy food, but at a price point that fits the residents because it's a large neighborhood, predominantly black, very low income on average. So let's create a large supermarket, but let it be you know, a food cooper- a cooperative. Mm-hmm. It's both worker-owned and consumer-owned cooperative. Well, I'm hoping that somebody from Vincent Gray's office, if not he, I doubt if he's listening to this program, but maybe even come to Baltimore. Vincent Gray here in the district put together some laws that they would build a hospital in Ward 8, which is that neighborhood now, Ward 7 and 8, which is southeast D.C., and he wanted to build grocery store, a big box grocery store in Ward 7, a big box grocery store in Ward 8, which are food deserts. So I testified, make them co-ops. You can, with the same money, you can make four food co-ops because <laughs> mm, <laughs> yeah. they, they don't have the big, and talk about all of the benefits that people make more money, they have better mm. benefits, and uh, they recycle more and they use more that's local foods and all kinds of benefits. The whole thing, yeah. right, the whole thing. You know, something that's really interesting, when you said a hospital, there's a guy, uh, his brother, um, uh, Phil Thompson. He is at MIT. He writes and thinks about cooperatives. He does a lot of work around cooperatives and, and unions, right? So there's a whole movement of cooperatives and unions working together. And he was trying, he's been working on a, a kind of a proposal to reorganize this hospital that is in Brooklyn that was threatening to close. We organized it as a worker-owned hospital with have SEIU. You, have you heard of Roger Green? Union. Roger no, Green? No, so Roger Green is part, is part of that district, so the uh, okay. district. And he and uh, Phil Thompson and, uh, and a bunch of other people, people at SEIU, have been thinking about that. I, I can't tell you exactly where it is in the process now. Mm-hmm. It was in the early stages. But anything could be a worker-owned cooperative, right? The unions would be perfect. I mean, in Cincinnati, the United Auto Workers are working with since uh, one of the cooperatives in Cincinnati. I forget, but again, it's, it's a it's a model that Cincinnati is pushing, or this organization in Cincinnati, the union cooperative model. Cincinnati Union C U I C or something it's, like. I that. I think it's C U. Yeah, it's uh, the worker owner. Uh, I've been to two, I've been to two of their conferences and they're. Phenomenal. Oh yes, right. Okay, so you're familiar. Yes, so that. Okay is something that I know is moving forward. So there, there are a lot of examples out there, and if you're going to push your local elected officials to do something, it's like, well, think what would that mean in terms of the hospital and the supermarket? Yeah. Well, Anita Bonds, I want to give a shout-out to her councilwoman, Anita Bonds, in the district. We had our first meeting last night with a limited equity housing co-op group. Oh, nice. She put together a task force to look at the benefits of limited We have a lot of them here, and the problems and how the city can come in and help these buildings stay affordable uh, because that's one great way of keeping some affordability within this regentrification where people don't have to move out. We only have a couple more minutes. I do want to give a shout out though for for people to go on ncba.coop webpage to get information about co-op impact which is on the 3rd, 4th and 5th of October and on the 6th and 7th and please come on back down, uh, Dr. Sutton. There's festival on the mall, co-op festival on the mall, and so there's going to be two days of, I think, about 35 different cooperatives having tents and so forth, talking about what they do in, in, in the uh, nation, these co-ops. Mm, oh, lovely. So last minute, what would you want to leave people with? I think much of what we said, I mean, in the last minute, I really would encourage people to help kind of convey the public awareness, to talk about cooperatives, to take the risk in, in you know, becoming a member of a cooperative, to start work around cooperative, um, and to, to really push our elected officials to invest in these enterprises as, as viable community economic development models. 
and the degree to which we can do that more and more, then we can do business with each other. Right? I, I've been speaking to folks in Jackson, Mississippi, Cooperation Jackson. We said, what can we do in Chicago to help you? He said, this is Kali Akuno. He said, um, do it in Chicago. <laughs> the degree to which you're building in Chicago, we can do business with that Jackson. The degree to which you're doing it in Baltimore, then we have a cooperative economy that we are starting to build across the city. Come on out this Friday, uh, the Friday the 28th, the Living Well, 235 Holiday Street in Baltimore, and you can meet Dr. Sutton and three other great guests, and we'll have this panel discussion on cooperatives. Thank you, Dr. Sutton. No, er- thank you. Everybody else live cooperatively. We'll see you next Thursday. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM, WOS, and 95.9 FM.